How many of you in the audience have been ready to surrender? Have been at the point where you're stuck, where you're asking yourself, is this what I really want? Or could there be a better way? Well, in the summer of 2009, I was there. I was on the verge of burnout. I felt tired, isolated, burdened. And then while on vacation in Mexico, early one morning, I had a conversation with God and, and made a decision at that moment that changed my life, our company, and a lot of people around me. And this is my story. My story starts with my grandparents, Rufus and Juanita Kilbasa. They started our family business in 1949, and I never knew my grandfather because he died before I was born. When he got sick, my, grand my father dropped out of college to run the business, and he was very successful. He grew our sausage business and expanded it into hog and cattle slaughtering, and that's the business that I grew up in as a teenager working summers and, and uh, school holidays. When I graduated from Southern Methodist University in 1984, I fully expected to come back into the plant and the business. But my dad and his wisdom said, not so fast. Go work for somebody else for a couple years, and if this is what you really want to do, come back and let's talk. So because my degree was in finance, I went to work uh, for a commercial bank as a credit analyst. And it was a fantastic experience. But it, after a couple of years, I had the itch to come back. And so I asked my dad to give me a shot. And he did. And so in March of 1987, I came back and joined the business. Because of my banking background, I knew that if we were going to really be successful, we needed to make a strategic pivot away from the slaughtering business and focus on building our sausage brand. At that time, our sausage brand was very small. You could only buy our product in San Antonio in the, in the mom and pop grocery stores in San Antonio on the south and the east and the west side. We didn't package our sausage. We did not sell it to any large grocery store chains. But I had a vision and um, to transform the company into a sausage company. So we worked hard. We took some chances, we invested in some local media, and we grew the brand. By uh, 2003, we had exited the slaughtering business completely. In 2008, we began uh, co-packing a private label product for a large grocery retailer based in San Antonio, and we grew our sales from a little bit under a million dollars in 1990 to a little over 20 million by 2009. But this is where my story really begins. Back to that moment in Mexico, overlooking the Pacific Ocean that morning, I was on the verge of burnout. And I, uh, I was having this conversation with God. And I said, look, I've done it my way for 22 years. I think I'm going to give you a shot at it now. <laughs> and that's literally what I said, uh, it was a, uh, a moment of surrender, unplanned, unexpected, and I was unsure of what I was really doing. And so I, but I opened myself up to new ideas and uh, challenges from other people like I had never done before. And the first challenge came from, or the most impactful challenge, I would say, came from a YPO resource named Jim Warner. I had brought Jim in to lead a chapter retreat for our YPO uh, uh, chapter in San Antonio. And at the very end of our chapter retreat, Jim asked us all a very interesting question. He said, I want you to name an unconscious commitment that you have. And I looked at him and I said, Jim, that is pure psychobabble. I am fully conscious of every commitment I have. And he looked at me and he said, Michael, I've known you for two days. And I can already tell you are full of unconscious commitments. So took a step back, thought about it for a moment. 
And I said, okay, if I have one unconscious commitment, it's that I've got to have my finger in every part of our business. He said, great, write that down. So I did. He said, how do you do your unconscious commitment? I said, well, I'm the sales guy. I'm the marketing guy. I'm the procurement guy. If there's a problem with production, I jump in. He said, great, write that down. So I did. And then he asked me, how does that unconscious commitment serve you? I said, well, it makes me feel like I'm in control. It makes me feel like I know what's going on. He said, great, write that down. He said, what's at risk if you change? I said, loss of income, loss of power, and if I'm completely honest, loss of ego. He said, great, write that down. So I did. And then he asked me, is it working? I said, no, it's not. Our top line's growing, but our bottom line's not. I'm frustrated. I'm stressed. I know I'm not as good a leader as I should be. I know I could probably be a better husband and father. He said, great, write that down. So I did. And then he asked me, are you willing to change? And I said, yes, I am. And he walked me through writing what he called a clean commitment statement, which was basically working on the company rather than in the company. What he was really trying to do and what he did is he broke through this level of fear that I had. He was breaking through this level of fear. He was giving me the courage to break through that level of fear because I was stuck up there in that current situation. So I went back the next day. I walked into the office of our VP of production. I said, Ishmael, from now on, I don't want to have anything to do with production. If you need me, I'm here. But otherwise, it's your deal. He looked at me and he said, Michael, it's about time. Then I walked over to a young lady we had hired recently to head our quality assurance. And she was a fantastic young lady, very intelligent. I said, Stacy, how would you like to start buying our meat? You're eminently qualified. I can teach you the process. She said, I would love to. And slowly, I offloaded all of the tasks that were consuming my day, which gave me time to focus on other things like working on the business, and specifically the culture of the company. And so I started taking that team members to lunch, asking them about the, the company, what they thought about it, and what I learned from them changed my focus immediately. What I learned from them is that in our path to grow the company to $22 million in sales, we had promoted a lot of people into leadership positions without giving them any leadership training which created a lot of dysfunctional leadership in our company. So I went to our HR director and I said, we got to figure this out. We got to bring in some leadership program to help our team members. And that's when we discovered values-based leadership, a, value, a, a leadership development model that was uh, brought on by Ken Blanchard in the early 80s. I reached out to Guy Klumpner, who was president of Holt Development, who had introduced us to values-based leadership, and asked him to give me the name of someone who had successfully implemented values-based leadership in their organization. And that's when I met Charlie Luck. Charlie is uh, the third generation to lead his family's company called the Luck Companies. They're a stone quarry operator in the Mid-Atlantic. So I called Charlie and I said, tell me about this values-based leadership. And for the next 30 minutes, he grilled me. I said, Charlie, all I want to do is understand about values-based leadership. And he said, Michael, if you decide to do this, it will be the hardest thing you ever do. I said, why? He said, because values-based leadership is not about changing others. It's about changing yourself. I said, oh, okay. So he said, come up to Richmond, 
spend a day, see what our values-based culture looks like, and you can see if it's something you want to adopt. So I did. And immediately after coming, after seeing it in action, I wanted to bring it back. And so we spent six months developing this right here. This is our mission, vision, and core values. It took six months because I didn't want this to come from me or our senior team or even the family. I wanted it to be a collaborative effort that included all of our team members. And so we developed this, and this became our Bible. I told our team, everything you really need to know is right here. By the way, my HR department did not like me saying that. But it was true. Everything you need to know is here. I said, you can make a $100,000 mistake, but if your actions are in line with this, you're safe. You can make a $100 mistake, and if you're not aligned with this, you're out of here. That created an enormous amount of clarity within our organization over what's important. We started teaching the five values-based leadership tools, which are DISC, situational leadership, principles of persuasion, conflict resolution, and influencing. For the first time, it, 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 for the first time, many of our employees were being introduced to tr training, and specifically training like this that is transferable, not just in work, but all over your, your life with your relationships at home, and they soaked up the experience. This also changed the way we conducted business. We began hiring based off of values alignment, adaptability, learning aptitude, rather than just technical skills. We began looking at our customers and suppliers through the lens of our values and asking ourselves, do they align with our values? Some didn't, and we made changes. We began focusing on building relationships and trust. We became much more vulnerable with each other, especially me. I began listening more than talking, asking more questions, opening myself up to feedback, and challenging stories that were in my head. The result is we created a culturally safe environment where people felt empowered to take risk, fail fast, and lean into discomfort. And it was good that we were just that we were getting this established because we were getting ready to go on a wild ride of growth. In 2012, I brought in our first big hire from the outside. His name is Chuck Harris, and he was VP of sales for Tyson Foods. And I brought Chuck in to help build out our sales organization and really get us ready and take us to the next level of growth. And he did. By 2013, we were growing 25% a year, which sounds great, but all of the systems and processes that we had in place were not ready for that kind of growth. Inventory started to grow. AR started to grow. And it was like we were driving a 1965 Volkswagen Bug 150 miles an hour. <laughs> and it just busted. This is what we looked like from the outside. That's what we felt like on the inside. <laughs> so there were two conversations going on in the, in the business. One was, hey, Michael, we got to start thinking about building a new plant to keep up with our growth. The one going on inside my head was we need to start building cash. So I reached out to Vern Harnish. Many of y'all know Vern. He's author of Rockefeller Habits of Scaling Up. And I emailed Vern, and I explained my situation, and he said, go buy the Great Game of Business book. Read it, and then go visit Jack Stack. So I did. I read the book over a weekend and booked a reservation to go to St. Louis for the annual gathering of games in 2013. I took with me one of our young leaders, Michael Johnson, who is the exact opposite in temperament from me, because I knew if both, I call him MJ, 
if both MJ and I agreed this was the right thing for us to do, then it would work. I also wanted to make sure that the great game of business principles didn't conflict with the values-based culture we had built. So each night at the gathering, MJ and I would go grab a beer after, after the day's events, and we would talk. And we realized, after the stories we had heard every day, that the great game of business model fit perfectly inside our values-based culture. So much so that if we didn't bring in the great game of business, we'd be violating our own core values. So in October of 2013, we implemented the great game of business in our company. We opened the books. And I was a nervous wreck. I was nervous because we had lost more money in August and September of 2013 than we had made in many years. I was worried that the talent that I would brought in to help grow the company was going to relieve once they saw the red ink. And those that stuck around were going to be paralyzed by fear. But just the opposite happened. When we opened up the books, immediately they started brainstorming about how to save money, improve processes, reduce waste, improve yields. We began building scoreboards with KPIs on it throughout the plant, having huddles, building mini games around specific areas of our plant and our company that we needed specific help on immediately. In short, when we opened up the books, the transparency of that activity, of that action, unleashed creativity throughout our entire business. So where has this led us? So that's been our growth since we implemented values-based leadership in the great game business. We've gone from a little over $20 million to almost $100 million in sales. More importantly, our bottom line is growing faster than our top line. We have a bonus system for our team members. We have the most highly financially literate team in our industry, in my opinion, which gives us a competitive advantage. We've been named a top workplace in San Antonio four years in a row. Our team members have never been more engaged and energized. And for me, it's been an answered prayer. And I've never been more fulfilled in my life. Thank you. <laughs>